David from DN Cognitive Counseling. Tonight we're going to be looking at the next part of White Fragility, starting on, ch- on page 24 if you're following along. And if you're not, and I hope that you don't have the book, it starts out with whiteness as a position of status. Being perceived as white carries more than a mere racial classification. It is a social and institutional status, an identity imbued with legal, political, economic, and social rights and privileges that are denied to others. Reflecting on the social and economic advantage of being classified as white, critical race scholar Cheryl Harris coined the phrase whiteness as property, tracing the evolution evolving concept of whiteness across legal History, she explains. Now, the most important words in that little paragraph was critical race theory. Most of us um, don't know what critical race theory is and sounds, wow, I guess this is a theory about critical race. And we should all be made aware because we want to understand critical race. Um, We want to understand different thought processes because most people who care about this have the idea that they want things to go well. So if there's a critical race theory, wow, that must sound really great. So let's take a look at what critical race theory is. It is a theoretical framework in the social science developed out of epistemology, epistemic philosophy that uses critical theory to examine society and culture, and they relate to categorizations of race and power. It began as a theoretical movement within American law schools in the mid to late 1980s and a reworking of critical legal status of race issues. It it loosely unified by two common themes. Firstly, CRT, critical race theory, proposed that white supremacy and racial power are maintained over time and in particular that the law may play a role in the process. Secondly, critical race work has investigated the possibility of transforming the relationship between law and racial powers, as well as pursuing a project of achieving racial emancipation and anti-subordination more broadly. By 2002, over 20 American law schools and at least three law schools in other countries offered critical race theory theory courses of classes which covered the issue centrally. In addition to law, critical race theory is taught and innovative in the fields of education, political science, women's studies, ethnic studies, communication, sociology, and American studies. Important scholars to the theory include Derek Bell, Patricia Williams, Richard Delgado, Kimberly Williams, Crenshaw, Karma Phyllis Jones, and Marie Matsudi. Critics of critical race theory, including Richard Posner and Alec Kaczynski, take issue with its foundation in postmodernism and reliance on moral relativism social constructivism, and other tenets contrary to classical liberalism. Now, the most important part of that is not whether you agree, whether or not to like take a look at the theory. Its very foundation of critical race theory is the antithesis of the liberal ideology that bring you the United States of America. Everything that it stands on is being attacked at its premise, because what you understand is that we as a society very much do not believe in moral relativism. If we did, we would have a very big problem with creating a society. If everybody got to do what they believed was right according to their moral beliefs. We also don't believe in postmodernism as an as a ideology. In fact, postmodernism is the reason what has caused a lot of this erosion of our foundations of the society. It's also a rewriting of history and that we don't need to look at things objectively because everything is subjective. And that gets very dangerous. And again, I want you to understand that when you take a look, your Wi-Fi, your cell phones, the medical advancements, the fact that we're looking for a coronavirus cure, are we looking for that through critical race theory or are we using the scientific method? When your child gets sick, or needs a surgery, are you going to say, well, it's, it's just relative. It doesn't make a difference who does the surgery. We don't need a doctor. That's, that's white science, per se. Or do you say, no, we use science because science is what's going to be most helpful to being able to either get the right medications or the right procedure. 
and it doesn't make a difference if the black the, the doctor is black, white, Hispanic, Asian. It doesn't make a difference as long as they're following the science, because that is the idea of objective being ob- ob- objective. If you believe in this concept of moral relativism or scientific relativism, then it doesn't make a difference. We could use, shall we say, um, a faith healer, because a faith healer is equal to a doctor. Now, if you believe that, okay, I mean, that's your belief system. I don't think the majority of people believe that, and there's going to be consequences to that belief. So if you get some sort of disease or some sort of issue with a problem, and you're not taking care of it correctly, it will lead to problems. Now, getting back to what she says, Cheryl Harris says, and she's quoting Shahar, by, by according whiteness and actual legal status, an aspect of identity was converted into an external object of property. Moving whiteness from privileged identity to a vested interest, the law construction of whiteness defined and affirmed critical aspects of identity. Who is white? A privilege. Who benefits a cure to the status and a property? What legal entitlements arise from the status? Whiteness at a various times signify and deployed as identity status and property sometimes singularly, sometimes in tandem. Okay. Harris's analysis is useful because it shows how identity and perception of identity can grant or deny resources. Actually, no. Harris didn't do any of that. Harris stated an opinion based upon what she's defining and she gave her definition to something. Whether it's true or not is not you don't go, well, Harris said this, therefore it's true. This is the whole problem with it, almost every aspect of what she quotes in this book. She'll say, this person says it. It's true. Okay? Uh, this person said it. That doesn't make it true. But people suppose things. And by the way, in postmodernism, it doesn't make a difference if it's true. It makes a difference if you want to believe it, your subjective reality. And then you can create it any way you like. And your subjective reality, you can make... You know, that fact that there are invisible people all around us that we can't see that cause everything to change and they really control us. And that's, that's my theory. Now, I don't need to prove it. I can just tell you it exists. And then you can write a book quoting me and then state, well, this person says it, so therefore it's true. These resources include self-worth. Self-worth, that's a resource that somebody else gives you, according to Robin D'Angelo. Self-worth. One of the biggest issues in dealing in therapy is helping people to recognize their own self-worth, their own values, that the, the language or the images that people gave them about themselves that were false or things that weren't true or might have been true but, but wrong meaning was put to it is one of the ways that people have to identify their own self-worth I wish I could give my client self-worth. Here, I'm going to give it to you. It, it just is, is, this is what she's saying is a, a resource that comes from this. Visibility, positive expectations, psychological freedom from the tether of race, freedom of movement, the sense of belonging, and a sense of entitlement to all the above. Well, I'm going to say this. Robert D'Angelo's effect of writing this book has had more clients talk to me about their guilt and feelings of shame and all these different things that they themselves have never done because the nature of people is to want to be good. And when somebody points out to them and they have a good nature and they said, you know, you want to do the right thing and somebody gives you a theory to something and you're like, oh my God, I never even realized this. I'm just this horrible person. I never realized it. And all of a sudden they have this guilt and shame that they don't deserve. So her idea that it, that white people have been you know, um, separate from their idea of their racial identity because white people don't identify in racial terms. They identify in the cultural terms. It's like they come from uh, England or they came from France. And as I'm going to show you a little bit later, um, the nature of that is actually a social construct, as it's true. But the nature of color is also a social construct. It's also true. The only difference is, is that she's holding that social construct to be much stronger than the people, way that people identify their social constructs. She's not e- holding them equal. 
even in her own theory, she's breaking them down and giving one more weight than the other. We might think of whiteness as all the aspects of being white. Again, I don't know what even that means. I don't know what all these aspects of being white are. All she's stating is, the, the only aspect of being white that I know of is white skin. And again, depending on whether or not you want to define somebody who looks or can change or feels a different way about themselves, is a question that I don't know how, how she would answer because she seems to say there's no objectivity but race, which she's objectively defining you by. So if the person I met in college who was African-American, identified as African-American, but her skin color was whiter than mine, and I would never have known she was black before she her telling me, then according to Robin D'Angelo, what would you call her? The objective aspect of me seeing that she's not a bl black and physically white and therefore would gain privilege by D'Angelo's ideology because the fact is that other whites would not be able to tell. Or is she black because she identifies and grew up in a family and identified with black culture? So again, that would be subjective. So it's, it's funny that D'Angelo objectively identifies white as this thing that you can't get out of because that is your delineation based upon the way that society objectively identifies you. But she doesn't care about your subjective ident identity. And she actually dis tries to destroy your subjective identity. So her entire theory is contradictory. On one hand, she's holding subjectivity as this bastion of where we should be and we should get rid of all these objective measures because that's whiteness. But at the same time, that if you try to use subjectivity your way and not hers, then it's a problem. So it, it, it's, it's, again, a contradiction in our own thought process. Okay. Um, aspects that go beyond mere physical differences and then related to the meaning and res, 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 resultant, resultant, okay, resultant material advantage. I guess it's the result of the material advantage of being defined as white in society. What is granted and how is granted based on the meaning? Instead of the typical focus of how racism hurts people of color, to examine whiteness is to focus how racism elevates white people. Whiteness rests upon the foundational premise, the definition of white, whites, as the norm and the standard for human and the people of color of a deviation from that norm. Now, it is true that between white and black, that, that white was defined first as human, and in order to merely justify slavery, they defined African Mar Africans as subhumans. No question that that happened. The issue is, does that definition still apply, and do people still walk around seeing that definition? And that I don't agree with at all. I don't think people see somebody from India and go, oh, he's subhuman. I think that there is, there is a comfortability that people have with in-groups in general, because you're just used to them and you're in, and there is a feeling sometimes of being put in an out group. It doesn't mean you can't get in to another group. You can. But there is a just it's just easier that yet you're born around that and you're sub you're socialized into that. Which is one of the reasons why growing up in the Midwest in a small town where it's unifying is very different than growing up in New York in an inner city. Those two places are not the same place in America. And you will have different views and different ideas and thought process about people in different groups because of your exposure. And the more exposure you have, the less um, prejudice you should have given understanding the way that groups function. So that, that connection and the ability to interact with one another really helps to get rid of a lot of the issues she's bringing up. Um, I just want to make a, this the issue is very interesting. Um, they did a study on African American police officers and reacting to African American um, uh, uh, perpetrators of a crime or, or or suspect. Okay, let's not go through that they actually did the crime, just a suspect. And they found that um, African American police officers were actually more likely to do uh, things than white officers were. And my guess it would be a reverse of this. I think that there is a there's such a focus in terms of the media that that a lot of times, for the most part, if you take a look at the group, that people are going to err more on the side of being cautious because of that, 
as opposed to somebody who says, well, I don't have to worry about that because they can't make that accusation against me. So I could act and do what I want based upon that. And, I, and again, that's a theory. I'm just throwing it out there as a possibility of, of a possibility why it's the case. The fact is that that's the case. I mean, that was studied and shown to be factually true. But my theory on that is because that it's not that the person is more racist or less racist. It's that I don't have to worry about that. It's not even a thought in my head. In other words, D'Angelo is saying people are not race conscious. And I disagree. I think that we're getting much more race conscious, which is not a good thing. I think we should be getting less race conscious. I think we need to see people as people, which, of course, then she would call me a racist for that because that's a horrible thing, and I only should see people in groups. Uh, but again, the, the idea that whiteness is the foundation of the society is also true because the people that created it were white. Uh, people that created um, a lot of the, the theories that we have in science were white because they studied it first. doesn't mean that if it wasn't studied by another culture that we would throw it out. People that are of different cultures and in different places, we do take it. Uh, example of this, um, Albert Einstein was a German. He was an immigrant from Germany, and he was very instrumental in the ability for the United States to be able to create the, uh, atomic, the, the, the atomic bomb. If it wasn't for him, possibly, who knows what would have happened and how long it would have went on or how many more people would have been dead. But the nature of taking his science, they didn't say, well, you're an immigrant in German. We're not listening to anything you have to say. You're part of the enemy. They took in because they knew that his science was correct and then they utilized his science. And I think that anybody who creates science, in fact, if you take a look at Black History Month, I know she's, she's going to talk about that a little bit later, that there are many people of color throughout history that have created unbelievable things that have been influential in our lives and have benefited us. And the idea of saying, well, that's because they fit into white society, white culture, is almost insane. Um, so... Whiteness is not acknowledged by white people, and the white reference point is assumed to be universal and imposed on everyone. It is true, again, that people in power will always be imposing their point of view. When England came to India and it had power, it put an end to the practice of putting the women on um, their dead husbands' bodies and being burned to death. They stopped that practice. Now, that's what happens when you have power. It is true. White people find it very difficult to think about whiteness as a specific state of being that, I've, that could have an impact on one's life and perceptions. Also correct, because it's not their whiteness that does it. It's their framework. It's their family upbringing. It's the way that they view the world. It's their ideology of things. I, I, I'm going to bring you tonight Ramsey Dewey to explain exactly this concept that I mentioned that you know he's one of the least racist people you'll ever meet. And the reason is he's had a lot of exposure to the world in, ge in general. As white, as white, right, excuse me, white and right. As Wright pointed out, racism against people of color doesn't occur in a vacuum. Yet the idea that racism in the United States can operate outside white people is reinforced through celebrations such as Black History Month, in which we study the Civil War and the Civil Rights era in which occurred separately from all U.S. history. By the way, this is my biggest gripe about Bla uh, Black History Month. And why is there a Black History Month? Why isn't there a Jewish History Month? Why isn't there a Asian History Month? Why isn't there, um, you know, a Indian, a Native American? And, and from India, you could also have it, Native American History Month. Why isn't there a History Month for every culture and every place? First of all, there wouldn't be enough months, but don't tell anybody. But let's assume, let's put people together, right? Because the nature of Black History Month was to raise the nature that African Americans played an incredible part of American history. And most people didn't know it. And what happened is, and, and my biggest gripe is, the everything is focused on the Civil War. But actually, if you learn history, African Americans were incredibly integral in the foundation of this country from the inception, from the War of 1776. Um, there's a famous painting of George Washington, if you've ever seen him. He's sitting there on the boat, and his foot is up, and next to him is two people rowing. And the two people up front of rowing, two African-Americans, part of his regiment, that were integral. 
And if you don't understand the history about them, I forgot their names. I think one was Whipple, I remember, but I can't remember the other one. But James Armistead. I mean, there are so many names. And there, But again, we know Paul Revere. And the reason why you need a Black History Month is because in the education system for a long time, that was not picked up to show people the other side. It was not shown. It's sort of like when I, when I go into schools and I say to the kids, um, particularly of, of color, but it's true of most of the kids who are in the inner cities, and I'll say, well, what is the ways to make it? What, what is the ways that you're going to be successful? And they give me three answers. And that's, it's across the board, three answers. I get the three answers is basically, um, I'm, I'm going, you know, you could become a, a, a sports athlete. Uh, the other one is an entertainer, uh, singer, you know, movies or any of those types of things. And the third one is drug dealer. And when you see the world in that way, it, it limits your vision. And when you limit your vision that way, what ends up happening is you set yourself up for failure. First off, how many sports athletes are there on every team in every single place? So ready, there, there are more people that live in Brooklyn than all the teams of all the sports and all that. So you're, you're really limiting that. And how many entertainers that actually make it and actually make money? I mean, there, there, there are numbers of them, but it's not like huge numbers. So what does that leave you if you have these three images? So the thing that you want to look at is, no, let's take a look at the black doctors, the black attorneys, uh, Johnny Cochran. I mean, world-renowned because of the O.J. Simpson case and the Cochran firm. Again, the, the idea of understanding that black people, African Americans, could do anything and be anything they'd like and see that hope, well, the idea was to open up the ability for the ceiling to go, wait a minute, I don't need to limit myself that way. And in my practice, more often than not, I'm trying to help people not to limit themselves. And it's, it's very interesting, and I ask this question many times to many of my clients, and I'll say, well, you know, whatever you had to face in your life, you had to face, but is that, what is it that you could have done differently and made something? Was there ever a time where if you would have made different decisions, things could have been better? And every single time, the answer is yes. So there is the external factors that may have been issues, but then there are internal ones that give us the ability to overcome. One of, one of my favorite shows is Shark Tank, and Damon John talks about the fact that he started in Harlem, I believe it was Harlem, selling his shirts, FUBU, and now he's a multi-millionaire. And he didn't do that because he sat and said, oh, I'm not going to do anything. He had a drive and, he had a, and, a, and a passion to do something. And the truth is, we all have that capacity. But if we believe this, then no, you have no agency. It's all about the pressure of what they do to you. I use the example of this for Jews very much. Um, I know that Jews like to be used for a lot of anti-Semitism. I, I like to use them for the opposite way. Um, if you take a look at Jews in historically, they have been subjugated in every society they've been in. Attacked, anti-Semitism, it's huge. And it's actually increasing again. But despite that, and despite the fact that they start off low in every single new immigrant place where they don't know the language and this, but very quickly, they start to rise up socially, economically. Why is that? It's not because people are saying, okay, let's let the Jews in. They focus on, from what I, what I see in terms of the cultural framework, is that they don't say, let us in. They say, we're going to do the best that we can to be the best that we can. And then it's sort of like what happens when you are the best at anything. People will find their way to you. And there is an element of that in the, in the, in the nature of the culture. You see this also with the Asian culture in terms of um, studying and their focus. Um, and a lot of the clients that I have that come from that culture, they complain. My, my parents really didn't love me. Everything was about success. I had to be able to be the best at this. And if I, and if I didn't, I was a failure. And, this, and that, by the way, that's a detriment, right? You don't want that either. But it's very strong in the culture that you need to raise us out. It's your responsibility. You need to do the best that you can. You, the family is counting on you. And that pressure, which then leads to greater success, also leads to psychologically more damage. 
So there's it, it, it's a you know catch twenty two. So you have to find the right balance. But the nature of what she's talking about here is again a problem in terms of that mindset. So we need to raise people up and help them to understand so that they're not just looking at things as, okay, there was slavery and we got free, and yay, that's black history. That's not true. Black history is much greater, has a lot more flavor, has a lot more really amazing things when you actually learn it. The problem is the people that misutilize it and make it all about just civil rights and about the needs of somebody else taking care of you, which becomes, an ide- again, reinforcing the idea in the community of being dependent. In addition, the general way that colored-based celebrations take whites out of the equation, there are specific ways that the achievement of people of color are separate from the overall social context and depoliticized. For instance, in stories we tell about black cultural heroes. The story of Jackie Robinson is a classic example of how whiteness obscures racism by rendering white, white privilege and racist institution invisible. Robinson is often celebrated as, as the first African American to break the color line and play in the Major League Baseball. While Robinson was certainly an amazing baseball player, the storyline depicts him as a racially special, a black man who broke the color line himself. The subtext is that Robinson finally had what it took to play with whites, as if no black athlete before him was strong enough to compete at that level. Imagine if instead the story went something like this. Jackie Robinson, the first black man, whites allowed to play Major League Baseball. This version makes a critical distinction because no matter what, how fantastic a player Robinson was, he simply could not play in the major leagues if whites who controlled the institution did not allow it. Were he to walk on the field before being granted permission by white owners and policymakers, the police would have removed him. Now, Robin D'Angelo is absolutely correct about this. She's absolutely correct. There's only one little problem with her story. That is the narrative. If you know the Jackie Robinson story, and it's in movies and portrayed and told, Branch Rickey, uh, who was the one that pushed for J- Jackie Robinson, as opposed to Satchel Paige or Josh Gibson, who, by the way, possibly were much better players than Jackie Robinson, chose Jackie Robinson because the issue was not his baseball ability. He wasn't the best African player, African American player at the time. He was a great African American player, but not the best. But what Branch Rickey wanted was somebody who was going to be able to tolerate what it meant and to buck what was going to be abuse and without reacting in a negative way because he wanted that player to be able to lead to a lot more players to get in, which actually is what happened. So her narrative about the history of Jackie Robinson is just false. She doesn't know what she's talking about again. And that it's not that people believe that Jackie Robinson was the best black player and he was let in. If you know anything about baseball, which she obviously doesn't, Josh Gibson, Satchel Paige, and there was a whole host. There was the entire Negro League that was beating the All-Stars every year when they played once a year. And that was known at the time. But again, why do we need to let facts get in the way of a good story? Narratives of racial exceptional exceptionality obscure the reality of ongoing institutional white control while reinforcing the ideologies of individualism and mediocr- mediocrity. And again, this goes back to that it is true that these were times where the laws were written in ways that kept them out. And by the way, if she were to say today, this is a law that's hurting black people, and this is a law that we need to look at and change. Um, example, a decriminalization of marijuana possession. Um, if you're allowing, because, the, the, and this is true in the stats, there are more whites that use the substance than blacks. Um, but there are more arrests for blacks for possession than whites. Now, you'll say, well, it's discriminatory. Well, it could be because the fact is in the, in the areas where the inner city is, there's more police presence, and therefore they're catching them do that, and therefore there's being more arrests. So if you decriminalize the possession, then you would be able to say, okay, then we'd be able to lower those arrest rates and be able to say that. But that would be pointing to a actual fixing something. That's actually taking a look at the system and saying, why is there a discrepancy? And whether or not, now, you could say, no, I don't want to change that, and that's a, that's a different argument. But the nature of looking at that is, would be looking at whether or not you want to change that once you understand what's going on. But like anything else, um, and I, I take the A8 idea, if you don't admit to what the problem is and you try to fix something else that isn't the problem, you're going to create bigger problems. Right? If the problem is 
of the system of the law, and then you say, well, it's because it's an institutional law, and it's just racism all around, without looking at what's causing what, you're going to re... It's like trying to say, I'm going to fix my car engine by changing my tires. Well, my car is not starting, but no, if I fix the tires, it'll fix the engine. It doesn't work that way. So you have to know what the problem is and fix it correctly, which, again, she doesn't have to care about. There's all, they, they also do whites a disservice by obscuring the white allies who, behind the scenes, worked hard and long to open the field to African-American players. Um, yes, Branch Rickey became famous for that. These allies could serve as a much-needed role model for other whites. And by the way, he is a role model for other whites in terms of that, and that is the reason why we have people that are wanting people of color to be in positions. This is the reason why we do, as a society, want to see equal access. If you say to most white people, would you like to see equal access? Now, there'll be a segment of white population saying no. <laughs> and there are racist white people today. That's why I said there's real racism. <clears throat> but we're not looking at real racism. We're looking at the obscurity aspect of it. Although we also need to acknowledge that in the case of desegregation of baseball, there was an economic incentive for these allies. No. There was not an ex in a, a, there was not a economic incentive for these allies. It's actually the opposite. Um, in, in the initial aspect of creating that, you're going to find people would be getting away from it and pushing it away and not wanting to, to see it. They would be coming in and booing and throwing things, and it would be horrible. Like Jack, Jackie Robinson's first year in the majors was, was, was horrific. Um, and, and it really speaks to overt racism. I mean, like, like if you know the story, it's overtly racist. And the fact is that the allies that were supporting and trying to help him to deal with it and to help him through it was the idea that they wanted to break the racial barriers the same way there was an abolitionist movement from the very inception of the country. I'm not against Black History Month, but it should be celebrated in a way that doesn't reinforce whiteness. Um, again, I agree about Black History Month and it should be reinforcing the broadness of black history and not the narrowness of only looking at it from slavery and the civil rights movement. There's, it's much greater than that and its original purpose was to bring in the idea that, Af that, that, that African Americans really, that they have the ability to lift themselves up the same way. Now again, when you see a systematic law that's stopping something, absolutely we need to take a look at that. For those who ask why there is no White History Month, the answer illustrates how whiteness works. Well, there's no Jewish History Month. There's no Asian History Month. There's no, in, uh, again, now I'm going to use India History Month. There's no Arab History Month. So her mindset of, of that is, again, a fallacy. But it was created as a way of trying to help lift people who were feeling disenfranchised, to give them something to understand. Because the other groups, although are, are systematically different, there's no disenfranchisement. White history is implied in the absence of acknowledgement. White history is the norm for history. Thus, our need to qualify, we are speaking of black history or women's history, suggests that these contributions lie outside the norm. Uh, there is no Women's History Month. Um, there are parts where we, we celebrate women's history and things of contributions, but it's not because it's Women's History Month. Ruth Frankenberger, Frankenberg, a premier white scholar in the field of whiteness, I'm so glad we have a field of whiteness. Describes whiteness as multidimensional. These dimensions include a location of structural advantage, a standpoint from which white people look at ourselves and others and at society, a set of cultural practices that are not named or acknowledged. To say that whiteness is located on structural advantage is to recognize that to be white is to be a privileged position within society and its institutions. And as you saw in the video when the racist said, Yes, it's a privilege to be white, because that's what a white supremacist believes. There are many white people who do not see it as a privilege to be white. And again, that doesn't mean that there isn't advantages at different points that they don't are not aware of. I'm not, I'm not saying that. To be seen as an insider, to be granted the benefits of belonging. Whites don't always feel belong. Um, if you are a New Yorker and you go down to the South, you're going to feel there's a difference. <laughs> Um, if you are a southerner and you come up to New York, you're going to feel a difference. There, there's, it's not because white people go, oh, you're white, yeah, come along. It, it doesn't work this way. This position automatically bestows unearned advantages. Whites control all the major institutions of society and set the policy, practices, and others must live by. 
although we are individuals of color, of people of color, may be the inside circles of power, Colin Powell, Clarence Thomas, Marco Rubio, Barack Obama, they support the status quo and do not challenge racism in any significant enough to be threatening. Well, according to her definition, the, the, they would have to destroy the system of the United States. By the way, I don't know how she fixes that as a, a problem because all you're going to do is create exactly what happens when you create Marxist uh, things or any other group. The, oppressors, the oppressive becomes the oppressed and then it becomes the opposite way. So I don't know what her solution is because ultimately there's always going to be people in positions of power and there are always going to be people in positions of non-power. The position of power does not mean these public figures don't experience racism. Obama endured insults and resistance previously unheard of, but the status quo remains intact. To say that whiteness is, is a standpoint is to say that a significant aspect of white identity is to see oneself as an individual outside the innocence of race and just human. This standpoint views white people and their interests as central to and representative of humanity. Whites also produce and reinforce the dominant narrative of society. Such an individualism and, and mediocr me medioc mediocracy and use these narratives to explain the position of other racial groups. These narratives, mediocrity, I keep thinking that word, mediocrity, medi or mediocracy, excuse me. These narratives allow us to con congratulate ourselves on our successes with the institution of our society and blame others for the last lack of success. Now again, um, I've been doing my work for the last more than 23 years. In that time, I've watched people who have done the right things do amazing things. Um, people that spent 10 years in jail, some of it in solitary, mental health issues, be able to do amazing things. People that were in psych hospitals, that came out, joined, um, became things, bought houses, made lives for themselves. This idea that people can't be successful until somebody helps you to be successful is a lie. It's just a fundamental lie. And this idea leads to something called learned helplessness. You read this book and you're like, oh my God, I can't do anything. My life is over until somebody grants me this position of power. To say that whiteness includes a set of cultural practices that are not recognized by white people is to understand that racism is a network of norms of actions that consistently create advantages for whites and disadvantages for people of color. These norms and actions are including basic rights and benefits of the doubt purportedly granted at all, but which are actually consistently afforded to white people. These dimensions of racism, racism benefiting white people are usually invisible to whites. We are unaware or do not, not, do not acknowledge the meaning of race and its impact on our own lives. No, because they don't see race as an impact of their life. They don't say you're English, therefore this, or you're Irish, and therefore this, or you're from uh, Italy, and therefore this, or you're white, and you're therefore this. That's the old joke about um, uh, God Almighty, uh, Eddie Murphy who dresses up in white skin on Saturday Night Live and gets on the bus and it's like, oh, now, the, now they have all this party going on when the last uh, African American leaves the bus. And he's like, oh, I didn't realize all these privileges. And Eddie Murphy is in, the, in the show is making fun. And this was in the 1970s or 80s, early 80s or 70s, late 70s, early 80s. And um, he was making fun of this idea like somehow this is what white people do. They start partying. Um, thus, we do not recognize the privilege norms and maintain it. It follows the name of whiteness, much less suggests that it has meaning and grants unearned advantages, which are deeply disconcerting and destabilizing, thus triggering the protective responses of white fragility. The next part we're going to get to is white supremacy. Um, that's on page 28 of the book. Um, and again... It's just mind-boggling. But I wanted to show you uh, the Ramsey Dewey um, statement of ethnicity that I think is incredibly important. And Ramsey uh, is a mixed martial artist. Um, he trains people in Shanghai. Um, and he deals sometimes with psychological and, um, here, political. Now, his, as I said, his history is pretty crazy. Um, and if you'd like to see the whole video, I'll put a link be on, underneath so you can see the, see the whole video if you like to. But I have one point about this that I would like to actually focus in on. So, like many humans on this planet, I am a descendant, a direct descendant of Genghis Khan. He had a lot of children. A lot of these 
ancient cultures, some more modern cultures, practice polygamy, including the Mongolians, and because of that, many, many of us on this planet today are distant cousins, or sometimes much closer cousins than we thought. Man, I had a friend in my hometown who turned out to be, I think, a third or fourth cousin because we had a mutual polygamous ancestor. And that was kind of shocking and revelatory because, again, my family came directly from England. His family was like, you know, in the United States for like six or seven generations. Anyway, so, yeah, we are much, much, much more tightly knit on this planet than you think. We like to put up all these walls and barriers. What ethnicity are you? What race are you? Who are your people? What is your cultural identity? And I'm not saying that's not important. We shouldn't look into that. Do your family history. Dig up your genealogy. It's fascinating. You're going to learn a lot of stuff. You know, honor your ancestors by learning who they are. Okay, I'm sorry about ads, and I hate More the fact that they have that. So, a passion with that. And at the same time, try to avoid the trap of putting up walls between us and them, between our side and the other. Because under the heavens, there is but one family, as the old proverb says. Thanks for watching. Now get out there and train. And that's why I find that to be amazing. And again, he is a American living in China, and he explains earlier in the video that his ancestry is from um, Celtic, Celtic, as he says it. Um, and I think that's what's important, is the fact that we have to recognize it's not us and them, it's us. And again, that's what D'Angelo would say is racism, and calling anybody who sees that as racism, which again, I think is really a disservice to people in general. I hope that you like this video and you hit like. I hope that if you don't like something, you'll tell me why as opposed to just putting a dislike. I always dislike when people dislike without saying why because it just leaves you up to like, okay, is it because they're racist and they have racist ideology and they like to keep it? Or is it a matter of something that I said that they disagreed with, which I'd like to hear because if somebody has another point of view, I am open to hearing it. And of course, if you, like to, if you haven't subscribed, please do and share it with other people. Um, and of course, if you'd like to become a patron, Please uh, hit the link below and I wish you a good night and good mental health.